Ayúdeme. <risa> So, what do you know now that you wish you knew when you started that I? Oh, <laughs> so many things. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay, two main things. So, I think I didn't realize how much I could get out of the college in a way. Like, when I arrived, I thought it was more less relevant to me because as a graduate student, I thought it's more like for undergraduates. So my college is like mixed, uh, grads and undergrads, but I think that's not true. I think there are a lot of there's social opportunities, but there's also a lot of networking and career related opportunities through college. So in my college, I think this is everywhere actually, you have a college advisor, and yeah. so this is someone who you can meet with every term. Mm -hmm. uh, and in my case, it's a, a senior academic who's in my field, but uh, or in my broader field, but not anything to do with where I work or my research, and she's not really like, doesn't know my supervisor or anything. And I think this was really useful, uh, because it's someone who you can always talk to, and it's not, it's not like your supervisor's best friend or anything. Yeah, I think maybe the, the only other thing is more bro like for DPhil. I think one thing I wish I knew is that the, the majority of DPhil students don't stay in academia long term as a career, and there are so many career opportunities for DPhil. Yeah, that's true. And on that note, I actually didn't know much about the career service here. Um, I just found out that you can actually talk to them about any sort of academic jobs or um, any sort of area you want to get into, um, and they'll help you with through that. I didn't know that, but also I did not know that my research would change drastically as soon as you know when you start. You don't know what um, you have an idea of your project, but it it evolves through time, and this is something that. Um, you know, you have to accept as a PhD full student, and yeah. So how did you go about starting your research proposal? So, I think that there are many ways. I, I've had many studies about people starting totally differently, but uh, mine was that I knew that I liked computer science, so like, I, but I was not sure at all what do I want to do within computer science. So uh, I got in touch with uh, professors and ask them directly, like, what would they be interested in? Yeah, I actually did the same. I reached out to um, the professors I wanted to work with, and I, um, well, my super, two of my supervisors, and, um, well, they said that my project is feasible, and they encouraged me to apply. They helped me with my research proposal, which is great, because yeah. normally you don't expect that, but um, they were really helpful prior to my um, application. Um, one thing I wish I asked actually is um, about, I guess, what sort of facilities are available in, in terms of, uh, because I'm, I'm in a lab-based archaeology field, but also um, a human, in humanities as well, so I wanted to know what sort of facilities are available for archaeologists, and yeah. Yeah, for me it's a bit different because I did this like PhD program, so uh, at the end of this like rotation year in different labs, then uh, we had the chance to choose our favorite lab and then we could work together with uh, the supervisor to come up with the project. But for me it was heavily based on the project I'd been working on during one of my rotations. So I kind of look at what I'd done so far in this short time and what kind of projected from that, what is missing, what are the gaps in the literature and what I'm interested in as well. And I discussed with my supervisor the same kind of what's feasible, what would be interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so he supported me a lot with that and then yeah, I went away and wrote it. And and it was a very good exercise, I think. For us, the proposal didn't matter as such. It wasn't like requ a requirement, but it's more like an exercise that we did to get started in like scientific writing. And yeah, I think kind of what you guys were saying um, about how you got in touch with the departments, got in touch with prospective supervisors, is kind of maybe the best approach to it because really this is kind of dependent on on department, and I think not everybody realizes that you can do that, like you know, this is your research, this is what you're interested in, look at the department in depth and look at what they offer, is it in line with your interests? And you, you're allowed to reach out to academics that you might be interested in supervising you and, and talk to them about it to get a really good idea about it. And they can tell you, you know, is this, is your research something that we can really support here and, and how and give you, give you ideas. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, different color. What has being part of your college been like or mean to you? It's a weird one because like before coming to Oxford I was like, what is a college? And like <laughs> I think that like I realized that like most of my life is within the college. The some of the best friends that I met were within the college. 
I also found that um, you meet a lot of uh, people in different fields in colleges. Yeah. I think it's important as a, if you're, when you're doing a DPhil especially because you're always in the department and you're talking to people in your field, but talking to people in other fields actually helps you with your research as well and opens different boundaries. Yeah, for me, I think it was really useful to have a uh, I had accommodation through the college in my first year, so moving here I didn't really know that many people in Oxford and it was really nice to have the accommodation sorted out and have a kind of base within Oxford before I even arrived. And, and the people are really friendly and welcoming, so it's a really nice place, as you said, to meet people and, and so on. I think it's one of those things that can be quite confusing, as you said, to people who are just starting the application process and looking at universities and be like, what, what even is this? So I'll have a department and I'll have college. Um, and it's something that we deal with questions about as well. Um, in, in the college, people will, will be asking us, okay, I'd, can you explain this a bit, a bit further? And then I think like when they, when they get here, actually, it's quite, a, it's quite nice to have a smaller community. And so it feels certainly for me like a very friendly atmosphere. It kind of, it, it feels more, I don't know if that's your experience from the other side, but. Um, yeah, sure. sure. <laughs> it's like a family. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you do have college moms and dads. <laughs> yeah, that's true. No, definitely, it's a nice, it's, it's social space, it's relaxed, it's nice. A lot of them are like quite central, so I think that's nice. Also, the, the fancy dinners are fun. Yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> so, I think this is in all the colleges, that's like kind of quite traditional, like part of Oxford experience as well. Oh, another good thing about college uh, is that you could apply for a lot of grants. Like, I don't know if you guys had the same, but I applied for grants to attend conferences and so on, and my college is quite supportive in that. So that's really nice for graduate students, I think. Yeah, it's kind of a different pool of opportunities, isn't it? For, yeah, for funding, absolutely. Because if you're wanting to get conference things, people will apply to their departments, maybe to their college, um, other areas. So it's just another kind of pool of support, which is quite nice. OK, uh, what inspired you to undertake research in your field? I can start. <laughs> um, so I studied biomedical science at UCL, uh, and, so, and I've always been quite fascinated about the human body and disease processes and so on. And then uh, I took a course that was specialist on infection, uh, and then I, this is when I kind of became obsessed with viruses. I think viruses are really fascinating. They're very simple, but they're able to cause such complicated and sometimes devastating diseases. And I think I became really interested in the biology um, and I was lucky to be able to undertake a research project at UCL uh, working on HIV and from there I, I became interested in more in the interaction between viruses and uh, our immune system uh, and so I ended up now doing my PhD focusing on the more immune side and understanding how our bodies defend uh, against virus infection. Yeah. I, I got interested in uh, archaeology at a really young age. My father and I, we used to watch documentaries um, with, um, on ancient Egypt. And, <laughs> um, and then I just decided to pursue it in uh, undergrad. And then I got interested in understanding materials and how they were made and what they were used for in the past. And that's where I decided to add the scientific focus. And um, I, came, I, also, I went to UCL for oh, my cool. master's. And, uh, and there I learned how to analyze ceramics. It, 6,000 years old, um, and I um, further decided to go um, to Armenia for a fieldwork opportunity, and they gave me samples to study for my PhD. So now I'm looking at 6,000-year-old um, ceramics from Armenia and um, what they were, how they were made and what they were used for. So I, I just, I, it's been a long journey, but to this, up to this point, it wouldn't have been possible if I didn't end up here and studying with a lot of researchers who are experts in my field. So. What was your undergraduate degree? Because um, presumably not in cultural archaeology. It was it oh, was it? mix yeah. and yeah, archaeology yeah. and I also took courses in earth sciences so it, it helped me with... Um, so you've kind of just been sort of narrowing your, your path into the exact right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I was captured by the feeling of creativity that you get when you solve a problem for the first time that nobody else has thought or solved. And I'm not sure if you asked me what I want to do like in five years time, but like I want to open as many doors as I can. And I think that research drives you to that direction. And the reason that I chose artificial intelligence was that actually it's not only that, it allows you to work with so many big problems at the same time. And contributing for the greater good is something that I think that every DPhil student is con committed to. So yeah. So sometimes a question that, that we get during the admissions process when people are looking at applying is, you know, they they know something about what they want to do and they know they want to do research but 
it can be a bit overwhelming. There are a lot of different paths that you can take into that. There are different courses. And so, I mean, there's one kind of very sort of practical bit of advice, which is to talk to people who might be on, on the course at the moment or, or people who, um, who supervise students in the course. Um, so, I mean, I think most department web pages have kind of lists of all their DPhil students. Um, and it's, I think, useful to kind of look at, okay, are these the kind of projects that, that are what I want to do? Or, or are these, this list, is this the kind of projects that I'm, that I'm more interested in? And you can do that. Academics love talking about research. Like, that's their favorite thing to do. You guys all know that. Um, so, so get an academic talking about their research and whether they think what you want to do is, is fits in those areas. And, and Yeah, also, like, to pick up what you said about different fields, um, like, sometimes the what you're interested in may be advertised in a different way than... So I think it's good to be creative with the search. Like, in my yeah. department, we often have the problem that we're really trying to recruit computational biologists. And for a long time, this was called bioinformatics or bio something. And it turns out com computational scientists don't look at the bio section when they're looking for uh, research projects. So by kind of renaming things, we managed to uh, recruit more people. But yeah, if you're interested in something that kind of like your field is kind of cross field or interdisciplinary, then I think it's good to try and be more creative with, with looking and looking yeah. in different disciplines as well. Because more and more things are interdisciplinary now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, yeah, it might be that the, the name of the course that you're studying is yeah. not what you thought it would be, exactly. yeah. but the research <laughs> is what you wanted to do. Absolutely, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm amazed um, at the kind of things that fall under the umbrella of economics. We have a lot of economic students at the college where I work, and it's, it turns out it's not all like numbers and, and money. It can be like how people behave, lots of different things under one umbrella. Actually, something that you mentioned that I, I wish I did before applying is um, I could have I should have looked through some of the default, current default students and perhaps emailed someone that might be in your research area and yeah. asking um, uh, what's your research area or what are you f focusing on um, how's the default structure it might be you might get different responses versus emailing the professors or uh, the departmental members that, that might be something else yeah because I guess if somebody asks you you know, what's it like doing your yeah. course, you would give a different answer to your supervisor. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I guess also a good opportunity to do that is a departmental open days. So you yeah. can just go and visit the department and there's a lot of uh, academic staff usually participating and you find most of the students that are already doing the process. It's a good way to grasp. Yeah, uh, you can speak to people directly. And exactly. Yeah. I think it's difficult because I'm an international student yeah. from Canada, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it would have been nice to come and see the department and see what sort of research they're doing, so. But definitely, I think getting in, what you said about getting in touch with people who are here, I mean, if, in, in case you can't physically be here, then that's a really good way to just ask questions, yeah. find out about the lab or supervisor or whatever it is. How has Oxford changed you? I can start. <laughs> yeah. Um, Please do. <laughs> <laughs> I think that when I came here, I thought that like being in one of the top academic institutions, you would get you get as much knowledge as you could, and like you would build on that, and that's how you would change. But I think what most changed me being here is not the knowledge. It's not about the knowledge. You'll get the knowledge wherever you are. It's more about the people that you interact with, the conversations that you have at all times of the day, that they give you the feeling that no matter the knowledge you have, you can pretty much do anything. I think that's the beauty of Oxford that, and the feeling that you end up getting. Have you wow. experienced? <laughs> I don't know if I can talk that off. <laughs> Um, I think I've definitely changed in terms of, based on what you're saying, uh, I think Oxford offers a really thriving community, so you're always trying to get better each day, and um, I think that I've become far more interdisciplinary in a sense. My, I've just always wanted to learn, go to different seminars and go to different talks. Oxford has so many great talks and different seminars that you can attend, so I think I've become far more proactive in terms of uh, attending different um, different seminars from different fields and um, my critical thinking has definitely improved which is I think really important and yeah 
This is, this is a really difficult question to answer. Yeah, it's a hard question. <laughs> I think when I came to study here, basically my goal was to uh, cure HIV and win a Nobel Prize. So I had like <laughs> relatively high expectations. <laughs> so I think I've changed in that I realize I changed how I think about scientific, or not just scientific research, but just academic work in general, that it's not so much about doing the, these huge things. They're, like These huge advances are, are not that often. It's more that you contribute to this kind of smaller, like it's more like incremental advances. And in that process, you're learning and you're getting better. And you can go on and apply that in whatever you want to do later. So whether that's like in your field, or you may learn something in this field and then apply it to a new problem. So I think that's kind of maybe what I've learned from this is like, a bit more realistic. <laughs> uh, and then I agree with what you said that uh, Oxford, because of its reputation, it attracts a lot of really good people. So you meet a lot of good people in the university, but also people come to speak here. There, there are loads of like really good opportunities to, to meet people and network. So I think that's also something to take advantage of here. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever experienced imposter syndrome? And when did you realize you belong here? Oh, I haven't realized yet. <laughs> I don't know why I'm here right now. Like, why was I invited to speak? Um, yeah, I think everyone experienced yeah. this. And I don't think that's just in Oxford. No. Uh, like, everywhere. I think but it's a general academic situation. You, of course, experience imposter syndrome, but in the end, you're trying to become an expert in your field, your own topic. So, um, but when you're comparing yourself to others, of course, you're going to see what sort of research is being done in that group or that group. But just, I think it's just it's important not to forget that you're also trying to develop yourself through this whole process. Um, you're coming into the program and you're starting from scratch, so you're trying to build yourself. Um, and the ways that you get, you end up saying, all I know is that I don't know. Yeah. So, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's totally something that everybody has felt. And like, I think the beauty of it is that the moment you realize it, it's not that it goes away. But when you look back, you see your difference within a week, a month, mm -hmm. or a year. And that's massive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, also, I think it's a really good thing to remember that you're a student so like you're here to learn so you're not meant to be I mean yeah I had a lot of uh, trouble in the beginning like comparing myself to postdoc supervisor who is has 10 years experience, research experience or, which is always good to try and improve and, and make yourself better but I think it, yeah it's good to put in context that it's actually a good situation to be in if you're not the smartest person in the room you're going to learn from all those people and develop yourself which is exactly what you said yeah I'm amazed by all DFL students because you're all like always like presenting papers or talking about your research and seminars and you know just all sorts of, of, of things that seem really really scary so <laughs> we're scared too <laughs> and it, yeah <laughs> so I yeah I think probably you kind of don't realize when you're going through the stage that like actually you're probably doing stuff that a year ago you wouldn't have been doing regularly yeah, it's true. It's scary, but in a good way that you, you get better. Because the more, like, the example of giving talks in a seminar or something, the more you do that, it's still scary, but you get better. You get more comfortable being scared, and uh, you can perform well in that situation. I think everyone gets scared, even, like, professors and everything. I think it's normal, and it's, it's part of it. But don't let it interfere with your your work and yeah just remember that you belong here like everyone I think 